Welcome everybody. Welcome to this press conference from the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum 2017 here in snowy Davos. Welcome to you here in the room and also welcome uh, around the world on the live stream. You're joining a press conference uh, that is asking the question, how are leading social enterprises creating impact at scale? Now, um, to answer that question, I'm joined by a wonderful panel here today. Um, and uh, it's a tough act to follow the Chinese uh, president. Uh, we'll give it a try, so, so welcome. Um, let me quickly introduce to you uh, our panelists here today. To my immediate left, uh, we're joined by Catherine Milligan. She is the director and head of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship at the World Economic Forum. Um, she's also a member of the forum's executive committee. Further down the line, we're, we're joined by Eduardo Bontempo, the co-founder of Geeky from Brazil. Um, right at the center of things here at the panel, we are joined by Nina Smith, the Chief Executive Officer of Goodweave International. And last but definitely not least, we're joined by Arbin Singh, who's the Executive Director of Nidan from India. So welcome everybody. Um, before we go into the exciting announcements you have to do and to, before we hear about the projects you're, you're working on, I'd like to invite you, Catherine, to, to briefly explain to our, uh, to our audience what are social enterprises, what are social entrepreneurs, and what is the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship doing very briefly? Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be here. Klaus and Hilde Schwab uh, co-founded the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship 16 years ago. And it's hard to remember now, but a decade and a half ago, uh, social entrepreneurship was a term that was not uh, very well understood. It was confused with charity. Um, Social entrepreneurs leverage market forces and business principles to solve social challenges, very simply put. Uh, and over the past 15 years, the Schwab Foundation has built the world's largest late-stage network of social entrepreneurs in the world, more than 320 organizations working in 70-plus countries. And if I could sum up the work of the Schwab Foundation, there are just three things that I would briefly say. Um, we offer global exposure and credibility to the networks. We, we put our awardees on plenary stages at forum summits in front of heads of state and a thousand business leaders, broadcast live. And that really matters, particularly when you are challenging conventional practices, which often means coming up against vested interests. So shining that kind of global spotlight on your work is incredibly legitimizing. And often we see that more awards and funding follow. The second thing that the Schwab Foundation provides is access to top decision makers in the same sector or sphere of work. And this we hear again and again. You know, Ron Bruder of Education for Employment said that the access they had to the highest level of decision makers in the Middle East unlocked partnerships they could not have even imagined. Jonathan Hirsch met senior political uh, Indonesian officials at the Forum's Asia Summit and is now working with um, uh, city officials to redesign slums in Jakarta. So many social entrepreneurs struggle for months or even years to have access to a minister or CEO. And after a 30-minute meeting here in Davos, they can strike a partnership to scale nationwide. The third way we support our community is maybe underappreciated, but it's vitally important. We build their capacity as leaders, primarily through peer-to-peer -peer mentoring sessions, but also through executive education programs at Harvard and elsewhere. Being a social entrepreneur can be tough and lonely work. And we brought our community here in Davos together for a two-day program ahead of the annual meeting so that they could share their learnings with each other, get inspired, and recharge their batteries. So many of them over the years have told me that these peer mentoring sessions help them grow tremendously as individuals, as leaders, and give them the fuel to continue. So if you add that together, exposure, access, and capacity building, all of it enables them to be better leaders, to mobilize additional resources and collaborators, and to improve their strategy and methodology. Ultimately, we here at the Schwab Foundation want to act as a launch pad to help them vastly scale their impact. Thank you, Eduardo. So visibility and exposure, uh, Catherine talked about, so let's use that platform. Um, 
Uh, your social enterprise is called Geeky. Um, if I were an evil man, I'd say all social entrepreneurs are a bit geeky. <laughs> but we want to hear about your Geeky in particular here. So tell us in a nutshell, what are you doing? Uh, I know you work uh, with the local income students in education and you're using technology in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. So, but tell us what, 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 what is Geeky doing? Yeah, so first, thank you. It's a great pleasure to share what we are doing back in Brazil. So we have a we are an uh, education technology company, and uh, what we actually do, we use uh, artificial intelligence to personalize the study plan uh, for each student. So in Brazil, 80% uh, of the students come from public schools with very low quality education. S uh, and also in Brazil, we have an exam, a national exam, in which every year 10 million people take this exam to enter university. And this exam is the only criteria to be accepted or not in the university. So what we do, uh, this uh, in 2016, uh, we did a partnership with the government in which we offered our platform to all uh, public students in Brazil. It was in total 5 million people that had access to this platform and could prepare for the national exam in a similar level than students coming from private schools. So what we try to do we try to, you know, bridge the gap in, that they have in the past and try to level everyone to have a, a more equal competition in this national exam. Thank you. And I also understand you have quite an exciting announcement to make in that field. So uh, don't, uh, uh, you know, don't hold back. Let us hear it. Yeah, so uh, we know from the last year exam that the difference between uh, public, pub the, the average grade of students from public schools and the average grade from students from private school, the difference was 70 points in a scale uh, from zero to a thousand, right? This year, we conducted a study from this universe of five million people with 140,000 students uh, with a third party consultancy firm that really attested what is the impact that we had in the grade of these students coming from public schools. The gap was 70 points. Uh, we could prove that by, by students using our technology, they could improve 72 points in average their grade. So actually the gap between students from private schools and students from public schools, with our technology, we could bridge this gap. So the goal of really leveling everybody uh, was, was achieved. So we are very, very happy to announce that. This is very fresh news. Uh, we are discussing the gov with the government right now uh, the results, so we are very excited about it. Well, thank you, Eduardo, and uh, for sure, congratulations from our side as well. Uh, Nina, let's uh, let's move over to you. So, your company's name, Goodweave, is, if, is giving away a little bit more about what you're doing, but still, I'm going to ask you, uh, what is Goodweave doing, and uh, and uh, what is at the center of your social enterprise? So Goodweave works to combat child labor around the world. There are 168 million children, that's about 1 in 11 in the world today, that are involved uh, in some way in the global economy, that are exploited in the global economy. So we've been working for 20 years to eradicate this, starting in the handmade carpet industry of South Asia. Um, the way our model works, it's uh, we call it market-driven because we partner with brands who um, license our program, um, and which enables us, really the, the key to our model is when a brand signs up with our program, that enables us to drive open visibility into their supply chain where they weren't able before to see down to the bottom um, past an order in a factory who is really making their products because many of the children and forced laborers in the world are at what we say at the bottom of the supply chain. Um, factories outsource and outsource again and there are in, in, informal workforce that are um, making the goods that you and I buy every single day. So um, what we do is once a, a brand signs with us, we work to um, map that entire chain. Um, as I said, in India, Nepal, and Afghanistan are the main countries where we're working. We work to clean up that supply chain, to surveil it, to build capacity of the suppliers to have good working conditions. And when we find children um, often hidden away in these supply chains, we rescue them and provide rehabilitation and long, 
long-term support for them. Um, and we don't stop there. We also partner with worker communities. So um, we uh, partner with the communities to ensure every child in the community is getting enrolled in school uh, and that workers are able to, um, to um, get their rights, essentially. So really, we're tying up both ends of the supply chain um, down from the brand and up from the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nina. That's impressive work. And uh, you want to add a little bit on the new announcement yet? You have to make sure. Here today. Well, we've um, we've already been able to uh, eradicate child labor by 80% um, in the carpet industry. So um, there's been a huge drop. And um, actually, right now, there's a big interest in issues of modern slavery, of child labor, and forced labor. Right now, some of you may know there are new laws now in the United States and the UK, and they're um, moving on to many other countries that require. Uh, companies uh, to have transparency around um, what's happening in their supply chains and to protect workers' rights. And so there's a big interest in what we're doing from the corporate sector and the donor community. And we just launched a new program called Sourcing Freedom. And the goal of that is to take what we've done in one industry and to move it into um, five more sectors in the next three years that are high-risk sectors, focusing in South Asia, um, where uh, about half of all the world's child labor and forced labor is happening. Uh, we are working in apparel, fashion jewelry, um, home textiles, the tea sector is coming soon, and also in brick kilns in um, India and Nepal are the main areas where we're working. And um, I did want to share uh, who some of the partners are in this work. So um, the CNA Foundation, CNA Company, Target, um, Humanity United, and the Walt Disney Company are our main partners. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Uh, again, this is impressive work from the community and really great examples of, of what social entrepreneurs are doing in the field. Arbind, uh, over to you. Um, so what is at the core of your social enterprise? I know you're working with street vendors. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing with them and what the focus of your work is, please. See, 92% of the Indian workforce is in the informal sector. And uh, so beginning from street vendors to agriculture workers, large number of them uh, depend on informal work and they contribute hugely to the economy of the country. So we began, when India began globalizing and liberalization began, uh, we thought that uh, instead of the informal workers being more marginalized, why not organize them, collectivize them, so that they're able to use the opportunities that were being created. And so we began with street vendors and went on to work with many categories of informal workers. And with each of these category of workers, we began creating institutions which are sustainable so that they are able to reap the benefits on a continuous basis. So uh, to give an example from the street vendors, we organize them uh, city-wise. So we have now more than a thousand organizations in each of the cities you know so each city has an organization of street vendors and we went on to get our street vending act passed by the Indian Parliament in 2014 which calls for regulation of street vendors providing licenses to uh, each of the street vendors and creating vending zones vending streets in Indian cities you know and that too through through a very participatory approach called the creation of town vending committees in which 40 percent members are from the street vendors community so with each category, so to give another example, recently India announced uh, demonetization in November mm -hmm. and the business of street vendors went down by 60-70%. So we quickly moved on and collaborated with the e-wallet companies and uh, we, are, uh, we are enrolling, getting them enrolled with the e-wallet companies on a very, la very large scale and very fast speed because we didn't want the behavior of the customers to change you know uh, like if they go if they start going for the weekly shopping in the malls you know then the customers will go away so that's kind of work we do to give another example we organize the food vendors set up a food vending company called Naswi Street Food Private Limited and that food company provides training to food vendors in hygiene and safe food handling and organizes food festivals across the country and that has become a very good income model for the street vendors and it 
it is also a, for the city and for the culture because it brings the uh, the cuisines that are being lost you know and the the recipes that people are forgetting the back into the back into the fashion and also it proves the theory that if the if the capacity of the people are developed they can themselves use the market to their to their benefit so uh, this is the, the this is the kind of work so we have set up helped set up west speakers uh, we have helped them to set up west management company whereby they they learn the technique of compost they learn the technique of uh, recycling you know and they are able to take contracts from government and they are able to make use of uh, the opportunity of waste management that is being, being created. So, so that kind of examples uh, are many and uh, we believe that uh, the revenue model has to be generated by the people themselves so that they are able to sustain their institutions so that even if we are not there, they are able to take forward. The, all the institutions are run and managed by the workers themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. And f for you, um, what are the next steps? Uh, how will you drive this forward? Well, I am looking at this forum as a very good opportunity of taking the Steed Vending Act, which we got in India, to, uh, uh, to many parts of the world because that's an unique act. And I see street vendors, whether they are in New York or whether they are in say, any city in South Africa or any city in, say, Colombia, you know, being chased away, being prosecuted, their goods being ha taken away, harassed. So I, I, I am trying to uh, i am trying to set up meetings and try to get contacts where we can use this opportunity so that that's replicated all across the world thank you very much the theme of this uh, 47th annual meeting is uh, responsive and responsible uh, leadership and i know uh, that is something you definitely have all in common and made uh, the centerpiece of your work but catherine you're more familiar with the community you might know more uh, th things uh, uh, our panelists have in common. Um, are these just exceptional social entrepreneurs, or um, what? What made some them successful in your perspective? What are the? What is the common thread you see here? Yeah, thank you, Garrick. I'm I'm struck by a couple of things listening to these stories. Uh, the first is that we're clearly entering a new era in terms of social entrepreneurs being able to leverage technology-enabled business models and solutions that were not even possible five years ago. I mean, uh, Sourcing Freedom is in part a data visualization tool. Uh, Nidan, uh, Arbind, I think, is being very uh, modest. Uh, you know, these are mobile, it's a mobile-enabled digital payment system. Uh, he's enrolled more than two million street vendors in two months. Um, uh, Geeky is an artificial intelligence uh, powered learning platform. Uh, so, look, technology is not a panacea. Um, I'm constantly saying, you know, social entrepreneurship is not an app. Uh, and, you know, often the implementation is much harder than the technological invention, right, of the thing itself. But in terms of cost effectiveness, uh, being able to reach large numbers of people, um, as we can see from these examples, technology can be a real game changer. And the second thing that strikes me uh, is, you know, sort of the st strategic collaboration in all shapes and forms. Partnership with government, partnerships with industry players, the Ministry of Education. And it's really easy to run around and say, let's collaborate. But it is much harder to do. It's much slower. Uh, there are lots of ups and downs. Uh, much more is actually out of your control. And so we at the Schwa Foundation uh, for Social Entrepreneurship are looking at the emergence of systems uh, entrepreneurs. And by that we mean, you know, social entrepreneurs who are building on their direct service models uh, and the evidence base that they've generated to be able to shift larger systems. Uh, the education system, the production system of textile products. Um, and you simply cannot do that through a direct service model alone. You really have to be able to influence government policy or shift industry behavior. Uh, but the eventual impact can be magnitudes of order, uh, orders of magnitude rather larger. So that to me, I think, are the big trends that we're seeing um, in the late stage community of, of social entrepreneurs in the Schwab Foundation. Thank you, Catherine. And Arbin already uh, expanded a little bit on what his expectations for Davos are. Nina, Eduardo, you want to add to that? Well, yeah. I mean, one of the big issues everyone's talking about here are the SDGs. And uh, so it's really important um, to plug into that conversation for us for uh, Target 8.7 to end child labor. 
Um, we are um, hoping to uh, capture the attention of more company partners and supporters of sourcing freedom to be able to um, work closely with the various actors working on this target in particular to, um, to be able to not only make progress uh, towards the goal of, um, of getting 168 million children out of child labor, but actually to be able to help measure the progress towards that. So really looking forward to having conversations with um, all the stakeholders about that. Thank you. Eduardo, you want to add? Yeah, so in our case, uh, we know that the discussion about education is very deep, very profound, and you know we don't want to end our work just you know preparing people to get into the university. So there is a lot of discussion on how we develop so soft skills in this new era. Uh, how can we better prepare the kids, you know, for the work employment in the future? Uh, how do we reshape the education as is using the technology not only to, you know, uh, improve grades, but, you know, to form better uh, human beings. So there is a lot of discussion on this. Uh, it's, you know, uh, something that is going to take a long time to happen, but we want to be part of this, this change. And, you know, I think there is very rich things to, to learn here. Thank you very much. Um, can I get a sense from the room if there are any questions? We have a microphone here. Feeling like the teacher who's asking for the homeworks. Nobody, uh, nobody fills up for it. Um, let me ask a quick... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, we have a question. I've come over from Maestro Malaysia. Um, there's a lot of social enterprise movement in my country too. However, it's still fragmented and uh, it's like everybody is fighting for their own. And I guess only a social entrepreneur would understand more another social entrepreneur. So is there any sort of movement, whether from the foundation or you guys yourself? Because I do know you guys network more than everyone else sometimes. Imagine your WhatsApp groups. But um, can that also be a focus, especially at this kind of meet and moving forward into the future? Because if the world is really borderless without any artificial divides, why not the SEs of the world get together and really make it mainstream rather than alternative as it is now? Thank you. Who wants to? Yes, Arvind, yeah. please. Uh, uh, see, there has been a process by the foundation to bring us together. And there has already been collaboration between us. So even in within, I mean, many a times it's really a bad situation. But f even from India, we meet here for the first time. You know, yeah. But uh, back home, the, it fosters collaboration, and uh, we do. We are collaborating with fellow social entrepreneurs. So even here, also today morning, we had a discussion with Fundacio Paraguay as to how to take the poverty spotlight model to India. So uh, the, for, the, for, the forum enables collaboration, and uh, I think that is a good beginning for social, because uh, each of the social enterprise would be like super specialization in a particular area of work, you know. So it's very easy, having done the basic work of organizing, basic work of creating a framework, it's very easy to get other models incorporated. So, and this is what the forum does. Yeah, I would just add to that. Um, uh, that we think of our organization as, a, in a way, a, a, a supply chain for delivering social change. So um, there are great opportunities. For example, um, Goodweave has worked with another uh, social enterprise that's part of the Schwab Network Vision Spring. So we are working in producer communities um, that are highly dependent on good eyesight to be able to earn an income. And so we can create an avenue for distributing the Vision Spring um, eye care you know, through our through our own service delivery. And um, there are lots of other examples of how that can work. Um, so I think one thing is to share those examples of collaboration where maybe it hasn't been happening yet. And I would just say that you know Schwab has really um, supported us to be in a place where we have the, the time and um, opportunity to really learn more deeply what each other is doing and um, there are hubs really starting all over the world of um, especially in major cities of uh, social entrepreneurs that are getting together on a regular basis and uh, some of us can share more about that. Yeah. 
and just to add, uh, I think there is this global collaboration, and the two days that we spent here were, you know, very productive. Uh, and there is also the local collaboration. So in Brazil, we have, you know, this network of uh, social entrepreneurs that, you know, get together, uh, you know, once a month or, you know, twice a month uh, to discuss best practices, to share, because, you know, I work with education, there's people working with health, uh, environmental, but, you know, the issues uh, in terms of management, the daily uh, challenges, uh, challenges with people, talents, are the same, right? So back in Brazil, we have all this collaboration. We are, you know, very close to each other. Uh, and not only, you know, social entrepreneurs, but also in the education space in Brazil, uh, we are very open. Uh, we share, you know, what we do. We share our management practices. Uh, and we really believe that, you know, by opening what we do, uh, we get a lot of feedback and we learn and, you know, uh, the sector is gonna benefit. Uh, as a whole. So we are going through tough times in Brazil right now, given the economy challenge. Uh, so during these times, we need to get even closer. And this is what's happening uh, down there. Uh, I would just add from the Schwab Foundation perspective that I, you know, I completely agree with you. Uh, it is absolutely fragmented, even though I would argue over the past uh, decade this movement really has mainstreamed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of that is very easily understandable, right? I mean, the needs are so much greater than the available resources to address them. Um, and, of course, uh, everyone is trying to then position, right, in that space. Um, I am, it, it was a, a pleasure and a privilege to be able to, to uh, spend the past two days with all the outstanding uh, Schwab Foundation social entrepreneurs here in Davos, um, where uh, we do very intentionally and deliberately try and foster and catalyze those kinds of, of partnerships across community members. And we heard a couple of examples. There are uh, countless more uh, through our network that, that happen as a result of these uh, meetings. I would just, um, Add that, you know, sort of we are not just the community, the, the World Economic Forum's community of, of late stage social entrepreneurs, if you will, uh, in the Schwab Foundation, uh, that we also are very closely aligned with um, other, our sister communities, we say, uh, and those are uh, young global leaders, more than a thousand outstanding uh, young leaders in, in 100 countries around the world and uh, the Global Shapers, and that's the millennial community of the World Economic Forum, more than 7,000 in 412 cities in 171 countries around the world. So, you know, we're really now moving um, uh, into a, a strategic direction where we are bringing members of all three of those uh, communities together uh, for greater collective impact because, you know, someone has solved a problem somewhere, and it's a matter of trying to find the best ideas and connecting those ideas um, with the networks of uh, entrepreneurs and talented people in other countries that can then really localize uh, to, to their own context. And, uh, and that's what, you know, we're trying to do. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you to all panelists. Um, mindful of the advanced time, uh, I'll, I'll close this press conference here. If the year 2016 gave you some reasons to be skeptical about the future, you had some, some great news here about that there is progress and that there's reason to be hopeful for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.